Hi, welcome, uh, Simon, to the DFC. Great to have you. Hi, Christian. Great to, great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Amazing. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, Simon. Um, you wear many hats um, um, in, the, in the sustainability space. So maybe tell us a bit more about what are those hats and why are you in Dubai today? Uh, well, so my day job is running the Charter Banker Institute, which is the world's oldest professional institute for bankers, uh, founded in Scotland in 1875. Um, I'm also our institute's expert on green and sustainable finance. Um, I've written a, a book on the subject. Um, I lead our courses in that area. I chair something called the Green Finance Education Charter on behalf of the UK government, which uh, seeks to bring a wide range of professions. We have 14 professional bodies, uh, many of them will be well known to, uh, to, to your viewers and listeners um, here in the DIFC um, to align their uh, capacity and capability building efforts around sustainability. And I also sit on the UK's Financial Services Skills Commission. I'm here in Dubai uh, this week with uh, the Global Ethical Finance Initiative, JEFI. I'm a member of their global steering group. Uh, they've been running a series of events to uh, help professionals uh, here in Dubai, especially here in the Dubai International Financial Centre, get ready for COP28, which of course is coming very, very soon. Excellent. So um, a lot of things to kind of depict, and I think we have a bit of time to talk about every single one of them. Um, we're glad to have you here. As you mentioned, um, we are on the path to COP28, and um, we're running a, a program with Jeffrey, the Global Ethical Finance Institute, um, and, um, and you were obviously part of our um, Sustainable Finance Summit uh, recently. Maybe let's start talking a bit about COP. Um, what does COP mean to you, and, um, and, and, and what do we need to expect for COP28 in the UAE this year? Well, it's interesting. You mentioned I'm from, I'm from Scotland, and of course in, uh, in Glasgow in Scotland, um, we had COP26, so it's COP28. Coming up, coming up here. Um, COP26 was a really critical inflection point for finance. It's often it referred to as the, the sort of finance COP because it was at COP26 in Glasgow that the global finance sector, um, under the leadership of, of Mark Carney, former governor of the Bank of England, now UN special envoy for, for climate finance, um, was able to assemble a coalition of, at that time it was 450, now it's close to 600 financial institutions under the auspices of the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. Um, and, in, and in brief, this was trying to sort of unlock the power of finance to lead the transition to a more sustainable world. So I think a lot of people have heard of the Paris Agreement. That's the, you know, the, the, the global uh, agreement on climate change, um, to which you know, 197 countries, parties to the agreement, so COP is the conference of the parties. That's yeah. why it's called COP28. So they, 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 they come together every year to, 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 to look at progress and to assess progress and how countries are, are doing on this. And the Paris Agreement has three objectives. Most people have heard of the first two. The first one is to limit global warming to below two degrees um, and as close to one and a half degrees yeah. as, as possible. So we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to do that. The second objective people have often heard of too, and that's to promote climate resilient development. So, you know, we know the climate is, is changing. Uh, um, global surface temperatures and ocean temperatures are, are warming, and we have to adapt to that. Um, but the third of three objectives tends not to be as widely known, yet it's critical to, to our world and to the future of finance. Because um, Article 2.1c of the Paris Agreement requires countries to make flows of finance consistent with lower greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development. And I think it's really, really telling that in you know, the global climate change agreement, the role of finance, that's sort of our role as finance professionals, the role of everyone who's listening to this is singled out. You know, we are given the role to help lead this. Yeah. Great. I mean, um, thanks for, for clarifying that for our um, uh, viewers and listeners. Um, again, lots of different topics we, we, we can now depict and, and, and um, break down into the different pieces of it. There's the Sustainable Development Agenda 2030, um, and I think the Paris Agreement, both of them were kind of um, done in 2015. Um, so 2030 is kind of the, you know, the, the, the next milestone, or the big milestone, and now we're halfway there. Um, where do we stand in terms of um, um, from where you described COP26, um, where there was a big focus on the financial side, 
Um, what do we have to expect um, at this COP28 where it's kind of a, you know, a halfway mark, trying to look at where we stand and where we need to get to? And specifically on sustainable finance, what are the gaps or the opportunities that we need to look at? Well, I think the reality is we're not making the progress we need to make um, to keep 1.5 alive in the jargon that's been used at COP26 and in Charmel's sake at COP27. And actually, the, um, the the most recent sort of assessment of the climate science um, conducted by the um, the IPCC, known as AR, AR6, which came out in 2021 and 2022, you know, that makes very, very clear that we have to take very rapid, sustained and dramatic action if we are going to try and hold global temperatures below two degrees uh, Celsius of warming by, by, by mid-century. So you know, what we need to see at COP28 is both political leadership, um, but we also need to see um, the finance sector redouble its commitments and move those commitments to action. Because yeah. at Glasgow, we, we, we saw lots of targets, very impressive targets. And some institutions have made some great progress towards those. You know, but the reality is that sustainable finance, green and sustainable finance, climate finance, it's called lots of different things, it's still, it's still a niche. It's still not in the mainstream of finance. And actually, uh, for a Paris-aligned world, for a world that we do save from, from global warming and you know, climate mm -hmm. catastrophe, the future of finance has to be sustainable. All finance has to be sustainable. In Mark Carney's words, every professional financial decision has to take account of climate change. And I think many would argue, including myself, now that needs to include broader environmental sustainability factors and social sustainability factors and a just transition uh, to net zero um, as, as well. Um, so maybe just uh, jumping in, in, in that point, I think this is obviously a very important point. As DFC, we're, we're driving the future of finance. Um, so how do you envision this future of finance to look at? So in let's say we, we, we zoom ourselves yeah. to, um, to a 2030, how do you want the, the finance industry to, to, to operate or to change? Like where, uh, what needs to change? Well, I think when we, we think about the future of finance, we need to think about you know, the purpose, the why of finance, and then how we deliver it. So for me, that purpose has to be aligned with sustainability. You know, ideally with the, um, with the objectives of the Paris Agreement and the UN Sustainable Development Goals more, more broadly, which you alluded to earlier. So that's the why, why we should be doing finance, creating shared sustainable prosperity for current and future generations. And that future-proofs finance and actually business, society and our planet. Um, but you could also think of then how do we deliver that purposeful finance? And that surely uh, links to the, the other global mega trend that's reshaping our world, and that's, that's digital and technology. So for me, the future of finance is sustainable and it's digital. Excellent. We wanted to talk a bit about... What are the different areas that the finance industry needs to focus on to, you know, accelerate sustainable finance and get on track to the commitments and the goals that we um, as a global community have towards um, 2030? What are those areas? Um, what needs to be done? Um, have you seen any good examples that um, we can learn from? Well, I've got some kind of good news and bad news to share. The good news is it's quite simple because we need to focus on everything. And that's, that's, all, that's, all, that's also the bad news. Because when we're talking about aligning finance and sustainability with the objectives of the Paris Agreement or the UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, but particularly Paris, we're, we're talking here about the whole economy transition, you know, the, the decarbonisation of almost every economic entity, almost every economic activity. Um, now, you know, those transition pathways, some will take longer, some will take less time, but we are trying to move the whole economy from a high to a low carbon model in perhaps 20 to 30 years, um, as opposed to the 200 years of the, the first industrial revolution. So, you know, banks have to be understanding their current exposures um, to high carbon sectors, firms and activities. They have to be engaging with their clients and customers, help them develop transition plans, make sure those transition plans are, are credible. Um, and and this, this, this is something that's, you know, frankly new to the great majority of, uh, of, of finance professionals, um, because despite all of the, um, uh, the great progress in, in sustainable finance, only some 4% of, of lending globally, even on the broadest definition, is thought of as green. You know, we talk about um, the great growth in the, the green and sustainable bond markets, which has you know, now reached more than sort of 1.5 trillion of total issuance, but that's still very small compared to what the 120 trillion or so of, of total bond issuance. So green and sustainable finance is 
growing quickly, but it's growing from a very, very small niche. And what we have to do is make sure that banks and bankers and finance professionals more broadly do what Mark Carney has told us to do, and that's to make sure that every professional financial decision takes account of climate change. Um, so that's all of our lending and investment decisions. It's our credit. It's our risk analysis. It's the advice we give to our clients and customers. It's every financial product and service we design and deliver. Everything we do needs to be informed with a, a lens of climate, mm. and I'd add environmental and um, social sustainability too. And what that then leads to is the need to uh, very rapidly build the capabilities, the um, capacity and the cultures of financial institutions so that we are genu genuinely aligned with sustainability, which is what networks such as the principles of responsible banking, the principles of responsible investment and so on, who I know are very active here uh, in the region, um, are, are keen to do. But it's a, it, it's, it's a long journey and perhaps it's a, it's a journey that, that always continues. But, you know, mm. it's the future of finance. It's, it's where we have to get we to. Have to go. Um, 100% uh, agree with you. So I think you mentioned a few areas. So one is culture. One is um, capability building, capacity building. Um, and I think on the other side, it's also like the, um, how do we make it scalable? Um, so we're, we're still at a small scale. We need to make it, um, you know, very big, very quickly. Um, maybe we can talk about each of them uh, briefly. Um, in terms of culture, have you seen um, a change um, in the boardroom, in the, in the leadership of, of financial institutions five years ago to, to today? And, and, and what is the change in culture? Um, well, 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 definitely. And I think there's some very good examples from the, from, from the UK. Um, I only use the UK as an example for two reasons. Firstly, that's where I'm based but also because of COP26 in, 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 in Glasgow. Um, and of course, that meant that UK financial institutions had a particular, I guess, both a moral incentive, but there was also kind of pressure put on them from the government and regulators and so on to be shown to be taking the lead. There are also institutions right around the world as well that are, are genuine climate leaders too. But I mean, you know, one of the UK banks, which um, you know, in the previous incarnation was often referred to as an oil and gas bank, mm -hmm. so, you know, very resonant for, for, for banks in this region, um, you know, starting with their board and the CEO, um, climate has been made one of the three pillars of their corporate strategy, and they are absolutely determined to deliver on that, and they are delivering um, on it. In fact, um, just, uh, just recently, sort of Bloomberg assessed them as one of the climate-leading banks in the world. And that's quite a transformation over a, what, a 15, 15, 20 year or so, so process. I mean, it, it is still a long process, but that culture aligned with climate and sustainability is driven right throughout the bank from the top. But there's buy-in at, at all levels. And I know that's meant some very difficult conversations with, with clients. Yeah. It, it also doesn't mean instantly divesting from high carbon sectors and firms. Actually, we're trying to transition the world yeah. here. Um, and so, so banks and insurers and investors have a really important role to play in helping high carbon sectors and firms transition to more sustainable models. Um, and that's what will really drive the transition just as much, if not more so, than you know, the new technologies or finding the next Tesla or something like that. Um, you know, the, the green and clean tech stuff is really interesting, really exciting, but we've got the rest of the economy to think about too. Um, and that's where that's I a big chunk of role. That needs to, to transition. Um, I really like this example because you're you're talking about a financial institution that has been really on, on you know on one spectrum on one end of the spectrum and is, is is and has managed to move you know towards the other side and and so it's an example of transition as possible but it needs to be really you know culturally from the top be driven top uh, down. Um, in terms of now like. We have examples like this, and there's a few in probably in, 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 in every country. There's a, there's a handful, maybe, um, and in some regions, maybe more than in others. How do we make it scalable? So I think the 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 most impactful thing is to build the capacity and capabilities of of finance professionals, um, because th this needs to become part of our daily professional practice. Again, go back to Mark Carney's phrase of. You know, every professional financial decision taking account of, of climate change, well, that implies that every finance professional 
needs to have at least a basic knowledge sort of relevant to their role and be applying this when they're yeah. designing a new product and service, when they're giving advice to a client and customer, when they're um, you know, sitting on a credit committee, what, whatever, it might, whatever it might be. Um, that doesn't mean we all need to be um, you know, climate risk modelers and deep sustainability specialists, you know, far from it. We need the skills of banking and finance to transition the world you know, just as much, if not more so, than we need the skills and knowledge of sustainability professionals. But we've got to apply the, that, that banking and financial knowledge through a lens of sustainability so that in everything we do when we go to work, um, just as we're, we're thinking about risk, we're thinking about credit, you know, we're thinking about the, the financial disciplines we, we, we've learned as professionals, we're also thinking about climate change and sustainability. Yeah. And, and, although, and again, that's how we change the culture of institutions and align the whole of finance with sustainability so that the future of finance is a sustainable one. Understand. I, I think that's probably um, this is also a priority for us at DFC um, with our DFC Academy, really capability building. Um, you wrote a book, um, and I think it's it's a book, um, probably one of the first books in that context to, to to support building these these capabilities or this capacity building. Um, it's about uh, green and sustainable finance. Tell us maybe a bit more of like why did you write the book, and what are the Two or three things that that you really um, want everybody to take away um, when reading um, the book or learning about green and sustainable finance. Yes, well, I, I wrote the book because nobody else had. It's as simple. It's as simple as that. We we needed uh, um, some materials to support one of our first courses, um, and uh, again, this was, this this was to try and um, upskill um, bankers and financial professionals. Mm. So again, you know, there's many universities who do a wonderful job um, teaching climate change and sustainability and all of the, 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 the sort of engineering disciplines and things that, things around that. And that's absolutely needed. But what, what, what finance professionals need is an introduction to the topic written in language they can understand, contextualised um, within finance. So what does this mean to me if I'm sitting in front of a client and customer tomorrow? How can I have the, the competence and the confidence I need to have those conversations about transition with, with my clients and customers or in, in whatever role I have in, in, in my institution um, and it just wasn't there so um, I decided I'd better sort of write it myself for somebody like me who wanted to learn about this stuff and it seemed to have resonated with people and actually it's now in its its second edition um, and we have thousands of, of, of students around the world going through our qualifications and, and programs and things in this area which is which is lovely to see because I feel like I'm making a, a, a difference in helping to sort of reshape yeah. the world world through finance um, in terms of kind of maybe two or three kind of key takeaways from the from the book um, I mean, the first, which I've alluded to already, um, is that um, you, know, you don't need to become a deep sustainability specialist. You need to apply your banking and financial skills um, with a sustainability lens. And that's okay. just as important as, yeah. as, as knowing around sustainability. But learning the basics of this will, will help you engage with experts when you need to, whether that's in your sort of central sustainability team in your institution or whether it's engaging with perhaps clients and customers who are more experts in these areas than, than you are. Because again, you need, as a finance professional, you need the competence and the confidence to be able to do this, and that's often often been, been lacking. Um, second takeaway is I think that the role of the individual is absolutely key to this. It's very easy to, to look at you know, climate change and think of this as a big global problem that needs to be solved by governments or needs to be solved by you know, um, big coalitions of 500 financial institutions coming together, and that's needed, but actually, as individuals, we, we, we all can make a difference, um, and we all should make a difference. Um, and then the third takeaway is this is really, really engaging, because this is something that resonates with people's, not just their financial and professional lives, it resonates with their personal lives too, because people are having conversations with their family and friends about this. People are, are seeing the documentaries on television. People are experiencing the impacts of, of global warming and other sustainability challenges themselves in different ways in different parts of the world. So, and as a, as, a, as a banker and a finance professional, this, this allows us, genuinely, and I, I don't say this flippantly, this allows us to say, it allows me to say, I'm helping to save the world. You know, that's what I do when I go to work. And it may only be a little bit, but I'm helping to save the world. And not many people can actually say that when they go to work. Yeah, uh, that's true, yeah. A lot of, um, I, I think you, you put it to the, um, brought it to the point it's it's it enables every single individuals around the world in every industry to actually take the future of the 
planet into their own hands. Uh, and sometimes I guess people think that you know their contribution is small. Um, but as you said, I think it's really important that um, at the end of the day, all the decisions are made by individuals, right? And and every individual has their circle of influence. Um, so I think multiplying that is, is, is a requirement. And actually, if I could just come in on that, that point as well, because I think um, we often think about finance in terms of financial capital. Yeah. We often think about it in, in terms of um, technological capital now as well, which is which is needed. Yeah. But actually, ultimately, finance still depends on human capital. Uh, that's that's 100%. all of us. Um, and we choose how to deploy financial capital. We choose how to deploy the technological capital. So actually, the most impactful thing we can do to align uh, finance and sustainability is to redeploy our human capital, upskill and reskill ourselves so that the whole future of finance becomes sustainable. Perfect. Simon, I think we're at time. Um, I think this is a perfect ending. Um, it's really about um, each one of us to make a difference. Um, I encourage everybody to, to read your book, um, to join us in the DFC Academy and uh, in the um, past to COP28 to learn more and start making a difference. Thank well, you so much for being here today. Well, well thanks. And, and you're making a difference too here, here at DIFC um, at, by, by helping promote this agenda. And I really look forward to seeing everything that DIFC and all the financial institutions and finance professionals in this region are going to be doing between now and COP28 and then, and then beyond. Beyond, absolutely. Thank you so much, Simon. Great. Thank you, Christian. Thank you.